Hello. Thank you for joining us again for our home discipleship. Uh, it is my privilege to bring to you the second question in the New City Catechism. Quick interruption into Chase's introduction from my basement, because I'm working at home like you're supposed to. Two quick questions that I keep getting asked. One, why do you make it black and white? Well, first off, because I like it better. And secondly, because it's easier to have a consistent look when shooting in different places with different lighting. So that's really why. Secondly, there's a lot of confusion about the schedule. We were trying to make it so that we worked through two different questions every week. So the first question we worked through from Sunday until Wednesday, and then from Wednesday until Sunday, you went on to the next question. So right now, we should be, today is March 25th, we should be starting question two. That will continue until Sunday, March 29th, at which point you will move on to question three. I made a schedule, put it in the description of the video. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email. Back to Chase. If you missed the first episode of Home Discipleship, uh, please go to our YouTube channel at Headwaters Church on YouTube. If you search that, you will uh, be able to find a video by Luke. And Luke gives uh, you the first lesson and, and tells you kind of what our, our hopes and aspirations are with this. Once again, this is for the home. So whether your home is just you or your home consists of 12 other people living in it, we want you to get together uh, with your home, uh, whether that is teens or children, and think about the things of God during this uncertain time. None of us have lived through uh, something like this. In fact, Governor Holcomb just gave word two hours ago that we're all called to stay home. And so while you are in your home, while you are thinking about what's going on in the world, Let's turn our hearts and our eyes to the heavens and think about our great God. Secondly, I, I want to tell you uh, about the church website. If you go to our COVID-19 updates and you scroll down uh, to that page, there's the Home Discipleship tab where you can find this video and, and others. Also, there's activities for children. So if you go to the Home Discipleship on our website, you will see activities for children. Now our question for today, what is God? And the answer in the New City Catechism is, God is the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice, and truth. Nothing happens except through him and by his will. Now notice that the question says, what is God? Not who is God? This question deals with the being or essence of God, not the identity or person of God. But we need to understand that we are talking about a specific God, not just some random God, but we are talking about the God of the Bible. And the God of the Bible, as D.A. Carson tells us, is self-defined. He defines himself in his word. And so we're going to look at his word as we look at this answer of what is God or who is the God of the Bible. He first defines himself as the creator and sustainer of everything in all creation. He is eternal and infinite. And if you think about the very first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1.1, it starts off in the beginning, God. The Bible presupposes that God exists and that he is the maker of all things. God does not change, as Malachi 3.6 tells us, for I, the Lord, do not change. And Jesus uh, is talked about in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And amen to that. When Moses encountered this eternal, awesome, powerful God on Mount Sinai, he came down from the mountain and the people couldn't even stand to look at Moses who just had encountered this holy and powerful God. They actually asked him to place something over his head because Moses' face was shining brilliantly because of the God that he had encountered. When Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, encounters God, there are seraphim, these angels that are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah says, woe is me. Habakkuk, the prophet Habakkuk, says something similar when he encounters this God that is perfect and glorious and powerful. He says in Habakkuk 
316, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. He knew that God was powerful and that He was able to take care of His children. He's perfect in all that He does and He is glorious and powerful. Not only is He glorious and, and, and powerful and majestic, He's also good. As Scripture points out in Psalms 106 verse 1, 107 verse 1, and 118 verse 1, it, it says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. He is also a God of justice. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, He waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who belong to Him. As Isaiah 30 verse 18 tells us. Proverbs 3.19 also tells us that God is wise. The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, He established the heavens. Not only that, but we know that Isaiah 65, 16 tells us that God is true. Because He who is blessed in the earth will be blessed by the God of truth. And Jesus said, uh, actually, rather, John, the apostle who is writing about Jesus, said in John 3.33, he who has received his testimony, that's the testimony of Jesus, has set his seal to this, that God is true. So we serve a true God, a wise God, a good God, a perfect God, a powerful God. But the last sentence in the New City Catechism tells us that he's in control of all things, or rather he's sovereign. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. In Colossians 1.16 through 17, it tells us, For by Him all things were created. Again, He's our Creator. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. God is in control of all things, that he created all of those things, and he sustains all of those things. And in fact, Colossians 1 16 through 17 tells us that is Jesus. That's who we serve. Romans 8 28 tells us that God is sovereignly in control of all things, and I can't think of a better passage, I can think of some passages that are equal to this in a time like the days that we're living right now. But Romans 8.28 tells us, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. God has a purpose and He sovereignly works His will. We don't always understand it. We don't always understand why God allows such things as the coronavirus to happen or the many other evils that go on in this world. But God loves us and He cares for us. And He is in control. We need to remember Matthew 10, 29-31, which says this, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your Father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. We are valued more than many sparrows. Praise the Lord for that because He cares for us just like He cares for sparrows. Now what application can we draw from the second question in the New City Catechism? What is God? Well first, an application that can be made is that God is much greater than us. And praise the Lord for that. He is a powerful God. He is a creating God and a sustaining God. And just knowing that can bring peace to our hearts. But not only can we make that application that God is, is greater than, than us, He's in control. And when we think about who is in control, it's a 
perfect God that's in control. It's a powerful God who's in control. It's a glorious God who's in control. He is an all-knowing God who is in control. I think about my baseball playing days, and no one has more control on the field than a pitcher. The pitcher can control the tempo of the game, and he controls, or at least hopefully controls, where the ball is pitched. In my baseball playing days, I'd have a baseball, and and I, I felt control of the game. Well, much more, God has control over our lives. And I'm thankful that I'm not the metaphorical pitcher of the universe, that God doesn't allow me to have the ball in my hands, and that I'm in control of all things, because I couldn't handle it. You couldn't handle it. But God can handle it, because He is good and perfect and all-knowing. He's wise. He's powerful. He's able to make the perfect decision every single time, unlike us. And he's able to handle wicked and, and turn it for good. Friends, as we face uncertain days here with the coronavirus, I want to assure you that our hope can be in the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is sure. The God of the Bible is seated on his throne in the heavenlies. This has not caught him off guard. He loves us, and he's even working the evil in this world for his good and his glory. And I hope as, as you believers face these uncertain days, that you can provide hope on social media, or you can provide hope for loving for your neighbors, whatever the Lord would lead you to do. And, and for those of you who are in the medical community, we want to say thank you. For those of you who are, who are grocers, we want to say thank you. And as a believer, as you step out into this world, this uncertain world, have that hope that what is our God? Our God is a powerful God. He's in control. He is working all things together for good for those who love Him and have been called according to His purpose. I want to leave you with Lamentations 3, 37-39. Lamentations was a book written by the prophet Jeremiah who was called the weeping prophet. God told Jeremiah to, to love on the people of Judah, to, to share his word with the people of Judah. And then he told him, Jeremiah, they're not going to listen to you. And so Jeremiah uh, tells the people to repent. He tells the people of the, the coming doom of the Babylonians, and yet the people don't listen to the words of God. And then Jeremiah, he laments. He has great sorrow and and, and praise the Lord. And in Lamentations 3, 37 through 39, Jeremiah the prophet writes, Who has spoken and it came to pass? Unless the Lord has commanded it. It is not from the mouth of the Most High that, is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain, a man, about the punishment of his sins? The Lord is in control of good times and bad. He's not out of control. And even in terrible circumstances, as believers, we hang on to the hope that we have that our God took a terrible circumstance. His perfect Son, His perfect Son was accused unjustly of committing treason, of, of various sins. His perfect Son, Jesus, took a cross for you, for me, that God took this terrible circumstance of someone who was perfect and someone who did not deserve death and that person died, that person being Jesus. God took the worst circumstance, someone who deserved nothing bad and he brought it about for his glory and our good because Jesus rose again on the third day. God is able, more than able, to stop the coronavirus. God is able, more than able, to take and make His will good through using something as evil and as sad as something like what we face today. We hold on to the hope that we have in God. We hold on to the hope that He is in control and He is much greater than us.